This week on WealthTrack, two giants of the bond world scour the globe for streams of precious income. BlackRock's financial thought leader Peter Fisher and Luma Sales great investor Dan Fuss pick through the offerings of government and corporate debt all over the world. Next on Consuelo Mac, WealthTrack. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack. I want to tell you about a new opportunity to watch Consuelo Mack Wealth Track before the program appears on public television. As a subscriber, you can see programs 48 hours in advance of the general public and also find timely interviews and commentaries exclusive to WealthTrack premium subscribers. If you're interested, just go to WealthTrack.com for more information. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. One of the most notable market trends of 2011 was the much discussed risk on, risk off trade where markets around the world moved in lockstep with each other. When investors were feeling confident, they bought so-called risk assets, such as stocks, especially small and mid-cap US and emerging market stocks, commodities, high yield bonds, and other securities influenced by economic growth. When investors felt insecure and uncertain, they switched into so-called risk off assets, cash, US treasuries, and gold. When all was said and done, it was the risk off trades that won the year. Whether or not the markets remain highly correlated again in 2012 remains to be seen. So far, the risk assets are ahead. But the outlook for global economies is anything but uniform. It is all over the map. The US economy is picking up. Top ranked independent research firm ISI Group, headed by last week's exclusive WealthTrack guest Ed Hyman, told clients this week that we've seen 14 weeks of stronger U.S. economic data. As a result, the firm is lifting its real GDP forecast, that's excluding inflation, to 2% and thinks the economy could grow faster. ISI believes the U.S. expansion is now self-sustaining. Now contrast that with Europe, which ISI describes as a black hole. Hyman and his team are predicting a severe recession for the year dropping their forecast to negative real growth of 1.5%. Whereas the emerging market economies dominated by a decelerating China are expected to chug along at 5% or more. According to this week's guests, that divergence among world economies is going to be a major cause of uncertainty and continued market volatility in the financial markets, including their specialty, the bond markets. Dan Fuss, Vice Chairman of Loomis Sales, is a legend in the business. Founder and now co-manager of the 20-year-old Loomis Sales Bond Fund, he has twice been named Morningstar's Fixed Income Fund Manager of the Year. Over the last decade, the fund has bested 88% of its rivals with its 9.71% annualized returns. We are delighted to have Loomis Sales as a WealthTrack sponsor. Financial thought leader Peter Fisher is senior managing director of asset management giant BlackRock and head of fixed income portfolio management globally. Fisher is known as an advisor to both institutions and governments. He spent 15 years at the New York Fed where he was the point man in the rescue of hedge fund long-term capital management in 1998. He also served as an undersecretary of the treasury. I began the interview by asking them about the financial market's biggest worry, the outlook for Europe. Uh, the two different places we should look, one is to the banking sector and one is to the economy. Uh, unfortunately, Europe made some big policy mistakes a couple of years ago. They tightened monetary policy, they tightened fiscal policy, and they tightened bank regulatory policy, all in the assumption they could be different from the Americans. And in the face of a big delevering crisis, that's the wrong prescription. And now they're going to have a recession. We don't know whether it's going to be mild or whether it's going to be deep, but it's pretty obvious they've just been too tight. That's why the euro was too strong or as strong as it was and surprised everyone for the last two years. So I think almost everyone sees the likelihood of a recession. And we'll have to see how severe it is. 
What's more difficult to predict is whether they can work their way out of the banking crisis, whether we're going to see some continued choppiness and volatility as their banking system has to keep shrinking. Uh, Germany is overbanked, France is overbanked, they've got too big a banking system, it's shrinking, and that creates a lot of volatility and a lot of upsetness in markets. And so that's in their future. How bad the volatility is is what we don't know. They're trying to recover from these policy errors, but we just have to see whether they can pull themselves out. So recession and volatility in Europe, not a, a pleasant combination. Yeah, I think it's going to feel more like a lot of last year. I don't think they've found the answer yet. Dan, what's your view? Well, I would add to that. Notice how cleverly I did that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you would uh, agree with I, that I agree and add to it? I agree and then focus on the volatility aspect because the major European banks are also major market makers. And as they retreat to Europe, not unlike, uh, say, Napoleon's retreat, except maybe a bit slower, the markets feel that. And the U.S. banks have also gotten more cautious on the capital committed to the financial markets. So you get sort of a double whammy. And it shows up more in Europe because their banks are now pulling back on the capital allocated to market making. So the volatility continues. With that alone, apart from, you might say, the more general influences on it. And I think that affects us. Maybe. You as bond investors. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. yeah right, because it's the bond side that really does tend to feel it, or at least maybe I'm more sensitive to it. But you need a, you need a dealer in between, by and large. Whereas in the equity side, you have an auction market. The bond market is not an auction market. You own them or you don't. And uh, so that's the impact of Europe over and above uh, the situation in Europe itself. So, so for people who aren't familiar with how the bond markets work, so that means if, if the banks are withdrawing as market makers, right, so th that means it's going to be harder to, to transact business, to do deals, to actually buy and sell bonds? Does it mean yeah. a less supply? I mean, what does that do for Not us as bond less, investors? Less supply, but it means the secondary market is far less efficient. And the lot size uh, traded in the cash market will be much smaller than it was, say, a few years ago. So why should selling, I care about that as an well, If as you're an buying or investor. selling a bond, it's going to move the price more, more frequently right. at any given size. So people have to scale back the size of their bets. They've got yeah. to think more carefully about their exits. That's in part where volatility comes from. Yep. And then we try to respond for that by being on defense and thinking even harder about the size of our bets. Right. I think that's what so, so from an individual investor's point of view, you know, I mean, are, are there opportunities that, that the volatility and what's going on in Europe are presenting for, for bond investors? Well, the tough one is whether you think yields of Italian bonds are at attractive levels. You know, that's the toughest call to make. Now, they were a lot higher than they are now. They've come in because the ECB has been buying and been financing now. They've announced their new financing program. So there is a question for investors, depending on your, how strong your stomach lining is, as to whether you want to come in and buy some of these higher yielding sovereign bonds. And Do you, Peter Fisher at, at BlackRock? I mean, or do you as an individual want to buy the higher yielding sovereign bonds that are well, feel pretty risky to me? or I think Italy is in a different category than Greece and Portugal and maybe even Spain. The Italian government's been running a primary surplus, that is before considering their interest payments. I don't think the Italian economy is in a, is in a terrible place. It hasn't grown much, but the Italian government's finances aren't anything like that of Portugal or Greece or Ireland. Right. And I think the market got a little overwound up about that. I think it's related to what I said earlier about the banking crisis in Europe and the delevering. The change came from the demand side. The big financial institutions didn't want to buy. They were too nervous. They're too busy shrinking. So the big challenge ahead for us right now, and it's probably a little risky to jump into these markets, is these governments are all going to be borrowing a lot in the first half of this year. There's a lot of rollover, and it isn't quite clear to any of us, I think, maybe Dan's got more insight than I, who's going to buy all the new issue stuff that's going to roll over. So it's a little premature to jump in uh, and think this is the ideal time uh, to buy some of these higher yielding government bonds. So opportunities in Europe presented by what's going on, Dan? On the corporate side, again, you need a, a strong stomach lining. 
and maybe two shots of brandy first. But uh, you can find things, but they're, they're one-off sorts of things. Uh, not so much in the name, but in the size. And then you have to flip a coin and say, well, if I can buy these things cheap enough, does that represent a, a reasonable value over a period of time? Yes, it does, unless Armageddon comes. Will Armageddon come? I don't know. That's reassuring, right? Uh, you know, you get into the risk tolerance that people have, but you can't really quantify it to the same degree that you could, say, market share with a semiconductor manufacturer in North America. It's a different type of risk, so it's an unknown. It's every bit of political risk just as much as the government is. You have something behind it that's specific, but it's a different sort of risk. Having said that, I think there are times when you can, if you are running money that can take that kind of specific risk in the context of a broadly diversified portfolio, then you can go in and bring a bid to an illiquid market. This is definitely a professional's game. There's just no question about it. Yeah, I, I think it is. There are opportunities, as Dan's right. saying. I think some quality, <clears throat> up in quality, high yield bonds in Europe. Yep. You want to be careful. But no one's tightening policy in Europe. They've already tightened it. Yep. They're going to try to ease it up a little bit. So that means that rates will either stay they'll where they stay are or, or go they'll down. They'll drift a little so lower. So let's switch to the U.S. And I think one of the big surprises of 2011 was how well U.S. Treasuries did. It was not such a big surprise to you, Peter Fisher, because, <laughs> because you've been talking for a number of years about the, the impact that deleveraging would have on the economy and on interest rates. But it was the, the degree of performance that we got in the Treasury market, up 10 year up 17%, the 30 year up 35% last year, was pretty much a surprise to everyone. So what's the outlook for the U.S. economy and U.S. Treasuries this year? Well, as with last year, we've ended the year, the year before, we've ended the year with the economy doing pretty well. And then if you remember the start of this year, we kept thinking the economy was going to accelerate and then it slowed down. Yeah, in, in so, this year being 2011. 2011, right, yes, right, right. this, this Sorry, past year. year. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And now the risk we're facing is, again, the economy at the end of 2011 looked like it was doing pretty well. And now we're all a little nervous. Can it really keep doing this well? Look like it's growing above 3%. I'm a little suspicious. I think a lot of us are nervous whether this can continue, whether with income not growing, whether households can grow their consumption faster than income. That just doesn't seem likely to pan out over the long term, but we do see some momentum and that's positive. So on the one hand, you sort of hold your breath and think, well, maybe the economy's going to find a footing here, but it's hard to see how it plays through with fiscal tightening coming. That is, the fiscal mm -hmm. stimulus the government put through is waning. That's creating drag on the economy. The rest of the world's slowing down, Europe's slowing down, China's slowing down, not as much as Europe, but a little. So we're getting less on the export side. So exports are down. Government spending's down, hard to see consumption, residential investment, doesn't look like we're going to have a housing boom. We're, we're still looking around for what's going to keep the economy going above trend, and it, it's hard to see it. So we're all waiting for that. But on the other hand, the Fed isn't going to keep rates this low forever. They've told us a kind of commitment through the middle of 2013. So I think our base case is by the time you get to the end of this year, you think rates are going to be drifting up, assuming everything's equal. But Will it be equal, or maybe we'll be looking for a slowdown in the economy, and we got to wait and see. So, Dan, you were surprised by oh, how yeah. well Treasuries did I, I in was. 2011. And so, what's your view now for 2012? And and you know, how do you feel about the economy? Is you know, two percent sound reasonable to you as far as GDP growth? Or okay, well, first of all, how I really feel is let's back up a year, and I'll run out and buy all long Treasuries. <laughs> 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 now, as far as the future. Uh, you know, I don't know. When I listen to our analysts, particularly the industry analysts, uh, then I, I come up with a little bit more optimistic. But you get a biased sample because they're talking with companies large enough to, to have publicly held securities. My guess on the future, and right. everyone always laughs about it, but uh, I, I would be a little higher in terms of real GMP, U.S. domestic. A little higher than 2%. Uh, two and a half, pushing three. Now. Whoa! Well, yeah. 
You can tell we have investments in the auto business. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and so are there investment opportunities in the U.S. Uh, fixed income market that, I mean, and is it a good place, do you think, to in well, invest? Longer term, I'm very worried about where interest rates wind up going. But again, this year, you know, looking at- Short term, what at, do you at, do? At the U.S. market, whether it's corporate or whether it's treasury, are there, are you seeing opportunities in the U.S. market? Yes moderate opportunities and they're on the corporate side. Corporate side. Mm -hmm. and, and would you go with, with Peter's thesis of emphasizing higher quality as well? Yes, uh, particularly in Europe. Uh, I phrase it a different way, strong business position. Yeah. At reasonable or below leverage. The strongest right. business position in the world in a volatile market if you have refinancing to do, you, I, I don't like that kind of risk right now, whether it's a single B or a single A, uh, because you can get shut out from the market by market developments. So you need to be in a situation where you don't rely on the markets for financing. You've got to be kind of self-financing, generating enough cash. Yeah, well, like the old-fashioned banker who wants <clears throat> to lend money to people who don't need it. Right, <laughs> right. And going forward, the other thing I, w I would put in here, right along that line, is I think we're entering into the early stage where market share in growing industries becomes very, very important mm -hmm. because, boy, you just have to have lowest cost. So if you're number one, maybe a number two, depending on the market, uh, your quality rating will be single A or single B, uh, B being riskier, obviously. Uh, but if you, if you have that position, then you're probably okay in a, in a situation where all of a sudden money gets a little harder to get to. Now, I don't know whether we disagree or not, but I'd prefer to say I think inflation's coming later than you think. Mm -hmm. Median income's been falling in the United States for three years. It's really hard to see income rising quickly. It might, that would be the good news, but so the mm -hmm. pressure on inflation, Europe's slowing down, China's gonna do okay, but China's slowing down. The risk for the U.S. economy still is, and I think the Fed's focused on this, is, gee, maybe things get soft again and slow down. Yep. And you can see inflation in the short run looks like it's coming down now again. Real growth might pick up later in the year. That would be the good news. But inflation's coming later than you think. Whether it's coming from Europe in the banking crisis form or from the sell side shrinking, that's a big source of volatility we've got to be ready for this year. There's another, which is political uncertainty. There are presidential elections all over the world yeah. Uh, France, Russia, Finland, here. South Korea, here, a leadership change in China, Mexico. We've got a lot of events that can come along and just slap the market in the face. And again, you gotta be braced for that volatility from that source as well. Are there any areas of big discrepancies that you're seeing in the market that look particularly cheap? I mean, that are, you know, they're giving you value for your dollar? Well, uh, if you had season tickets for the Red Sox. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the, uh, nothing really extraordinary. My own view, and this is very selective and very specific within the group, the financial area. Uh, now, having said that, uh, I don't think people even inside the financial organizations necessarily know how to analyze them <laughs> completely. So you're talking about banks. Uh, banks and insurance companies. Now, there are a lot of moving variables in both those industries. They're probably among the most difficult to analyze as businesses uh, because there's a lot you don't know and there might be some stuff that the, that the management itself couldn't possibly know because it, you know, it depends on what happens in the future. But if you look at how these securities normally trade, then you can say, well, okay, they're a little bit wide, but when you get days, even now, even, uh, today. Uh, you can have a, a 30, 40, 50 basis points variation just depending on the activity of that day with small size relative to the norm. And, and when you're saying, so 30 to 50 basis points, a half a percentage point yield well, well, differential because, between yes. the, the bid the ask between no, or, over or, the course or, of the days. So yeah, I mean, over the volatility, course. Volatility, that's the short Oh, over the course of the day, right. no, which yes. is huge in the bond market. Yes. Huge. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, that's yeah. A, so that's the volatility you're talking about. Right, right. The but market. then you're going to live with them. Right. That's the other part of this. If you change your mind, you say, well, that's too bad uh, because you own it. When you bring a bid to an illiquid market, uh, don't expect to sell it 
uh, in the next four or five years, realistically. Four or five years? Wow. So you've got to really do your homework and love what you are buying. Yeah, if that's... That's the uh, intestinal fortitude we're both, right. we're yeah. both referring so, to. So, all right, two quick questions. One is emerging markets. I mean, a, a, you know, a, a big, one of the, uh, a major theme the last several years in Wealthtrack has been, you know, buying emerging market, local currency bonds, opportunities there. Is that an area we should be, that you're investing in at BlackRock? Yes, uh, we're, we're, we're focused on that. And I think right now you can see they've tightened policy in places like China and India. Now they have to ease. Good for bonds volatility, again. Ease mon and that's a pretty good time to come in and try to buy. Now, maybe it's more volatile and there's some jumpiness in the markets and the financial sector shrinks a bit, but it's a pretty good time for some of those markets to come by. Even if they're slowing down, that tells you policy is going to be easy to friendly mm -hmm. and we're not going to face the backup. Again, you want to look for quality, especially in those markets. There are going to be some companies that don't make it as the economy slow down. They're used to very rapid growth when those companies don't have a business model that can sustain itself when growth slows down. You don't want to be owning those bonds. Oh, I agree with that. Emerging completely. markets, opportunities, but, but yeah. local currency. You feel the same way, Dan? Uh, local currency, depending on the country. Right. <laughs> Final question. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio. The last time, Peter Fisher, it was a Vanguard Treasury bond fund, which has done extremely well. So what replicate. is it this year? I'll never replicate that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's that, 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 that was a winner. Um, you know, I, there's some interesting opportunities in the high yield market and in uh, closed end funds, but a lot of those have been bid up now. Everyone's mm -hmm. taken that interest. So I think a sensible portfolio that's looking for a little income might want to include a closed end bank loan fund. The Eaton Vance Floating Rate Income Trust is a terrific little fund uh, focused on this area. It's trading at a discount now, about 5%. Scott Page runs it. It's got a nice coupon around 7%. I think that's the kind of thing be good to have in a portfolio, generate a little income. Uh, and if you're worried about rates backing up, that's the kind of product that would help you there, but trading at a discount now. Thank you. And, and our, our viewers do know that you're not allowed to recommend any of your own funds, uh, but you're all here because you represent terrific companies and terrific funds. Dan, one investment, long-term river storage portfolio. The last time, as I said, was the New Zealand government bond. Right. I am at the other extreme of risk for those with a speculative turn of mind. I would actually focus on either the largest, say, commercial bank in the U.S., Bank of America type, or, and this is a, a higher level of uncertainty, a Goldman or Morgan Stanley, because as I think through this whole process, of deregulation and make some naive guesses. It seems to me that the two big brokers out there are, are going to probably get out, try to get out partially. They, they're too big, but they'll partially get out from under some of the banking constraints. And they'll be the two biggest market makers out there in uh, corporate securities. And that's, that's Goldman and Morgan Stanley. So stock or bonds? Of, of those well, in, uh, on the bond side, I'd be inclined to go for B of A bonds and Morgan Stanley bonds at, at today's prices right. and tr today's values. Now, you have the volatility factor. On the stock side, I, I think Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. Now, that is unusual for a bond person to say. I'm sure I'll, I'll be questioned unfriendly like when I get back to the office. but. Uh, that, that those seem to, I, I'm in Warren Buffett's camp that says, well, in the case of the, the banks, B of A common stock, it is the biggest bank around. All right. So we'll leave it there. You are known as a risk taker. You've got a 20-year track record at the Luma Sales Bond Fund to prove how well that has played out over the last Most of the 20 time. years, Dan Foss. So thank you so much for being here at WealthTrack. And Peter Fisher from BlackRock, thanks so much for joining us as well. Thank you. A major takeaway from interviewing these two pros is how essential it is for bond investors to have professional management. With the exception of the U.S. Treasury market, global fixed income markets are not transparent, liquid, or efficient. As Dan Foss pointed out, they are complex, difficult, and in many cases illiquid even for the pros. So this week's action point is if you are investing in anything other than U.S. Treasuries, invest with top bond fund managers with superb long-term track records. 
And just as important, make sure their funds fit your personal tolerance for risk. On WealthTrack, we have had some of the best bond managers in the business as guests. Loomis Sales' Dan Fuss, PIMCO's Bill Gross, and Franklin Templeton's Michael Hasenstab all have been Morningstar Fixed Income Fund Managers of the Year, Bill for the Decade. Each has a different approach to global bond investing. The one thing they have in common, excellent long-term performance. I hope you can join us next week. We're going to look into alternative investments. What are they and which ones, if any, belong in your portfolio? Our guests are going to be Phil DeMuth, co-author of The Excellent Primer, The Little Book of Alternative Investments. And speaking of excellent track records, Tocqueville Gold Fund's manager, John Hathaway. Now, if you wish to see our WealthTrack guests ahead of the crowd, subscribers can now watch our program 48 hours in advance, along with timely interviews exclusive to WealthTrack premium subscribers. To sign up, go to our website, WealthTrack.com. And that wraps up this edition of WealthTrack. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the Martin Luther King Day holiday and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Research Affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market. Thank <music> you.